and welcome to The Fan Show. This is your host, as always, Richard Tiemann, and this is the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world show made for the fans by a fan. Happy Wednesday, Fan Nation. Thank you all for joining me. It is episode 372, and we have a special guest on this episode this evening, Nathan O'Brien, founder, uh, creator of Lilac City Comic Con here in Spokane, and will be attempting a new venture, uh, an extension of himself through the ways of con and so what was just a one every year in lilac city is now going across state line to the lovely city of Coeur d'Alene for the first ever hopefully first annual but the inaugural lake city comic con and that will be at the kootenai county fairgrounds it is a one day only con and it is something to help us uh as as comic con goers nerds and uh geeks alike get through until i guess con season which we we talk about because we did pre-record the segment in the interview big thank you to nathan for uh, taking the time to be on the show but that is saturday and that is going to be a lot of fun in my opinion it was uh lilac city was my first ever comic con that i attended uh in any way shape or form but i got to do media for it it was a blast nathan was happy to have me back uh, for this one, being a, it's a very special occasion, it is his first one. And so with that, we are going to venture off into uncharted waters. And I think uh, he's got nothing to worry about. I really do. And talking to him, I feel like he has put his his best foot forward. And we're gonna we're gonna give this thing a, a try. And the beauty of it is for him, the Seahawks have a bye week, and he's a Seahawks fan, and you'll hear that. Uh, in the segment so you know if you don't you don't that's fine but if you do you know if you're a Seahawks fan that's that's there I guess but Eastern Eagles also have a bye week because uh, when it dawned on me that I now have a season pass for Eastern and that Comic-Con was coming up and it's a Saturday and Eastern's next game after this tough loss to Weber State spoiler alert um, I was like oh man Eastern's next next game is a home one and it's a rivalry game. I really don't want to miss it, but you know, I'm committed to this con and and so I will go because I have I've made that commitment way back when and I will honor that. And Eastern can be without me for a game. But hey, they got a bye week. Good news. So uh, him and I are not missing any football. Not that, not that the Seahawks play on Saturday. But the point is, is that he's got one less thing looming in the back of his mind that he has to worry about. So he really can just relax on Sunday and take in uh, everything and hopefully pat himself on the back for a job well done. We will talk to him. It's a great segment. You won't want to miss it. It's got a little bit of everything, some pop culture and some football mixed in. Fan show will be at Lake City Comic Con as media under the pop culture division banner. So that's another exciting thing for this weekend to look forward to uh for us here but uh for those of you listening that will tune in uh in podcast form thank you and so with that let's go ahead and get right into it we've got a bunch of them and so here they are today's headlines and headlines as always of course, brought to you by Dynamite Enterprises. You need to hit up Ethan today uh, as soon as possible, really, because he is getting busier and busier at his shop, and, and deservedly so. He made these awesome zombie trophies for the uh, zombie crawl. It's one of many uh, pub crawls that we do around here in the Spokane area, but uh, he made some nifty little trophies for those, and I got to see him, and I was like, how did you make... The, the zombie dude at the top, he's like, we actually found those online. He's like, I don't have a machine that can just willy-nilly make whatever topper I want. i got to find them. And if I can't, then, you know, we got to go with the, the next best. But, yeah, somebody had zombie trophy toppers, of all things. And I think that's friggin' fantastic. I really do. So he made those. I got a chance to check them out. Uh, I, I would I would have loved to win one. I was unavailable that evening, though. And I, I it's... 
you know, it's one thing to go out for best costume. It's another to uh, have to have such strict parameters. This was for best zombie, you know, and I, if I'm going to dress up, I'm not going to dress up as, as a zombie. To me, it's overdone, but I get it. I get it. So anyway, he's been working on some stuff for me. I actually went and shot a uh, quote unquote commercial for him. It was an assignment that I had to turn in for my digital, my sports digital production class. They wanted us to shoot, edit and produce a commercial. And I couldn't think of what I would do for the fan show commercial wise, because I, I have, I've had a vision in my head for how I believe a fan show commercial would go if it was to be on YouTube TV or otherwise. But, uh, this, you had to have at least 20 different shots, and I have this fascination with one shot, or single shot, or whatever, whatever they call it in the biz, but uh, you all remember the Old Spice commercial, the, the dude on the horse? I'm on a horse. Look at your men. Now back to me. Now look at your man. Now back to me. Look at this. It's two tickets to that thing you love. You know that commercial. We love it. I was blown away by that, and for me, with everything that the fan show does... That's how I think a, a fan show commercial would, would be. It's, it's one, one still shot, but the background and everything is changing because we at the fan show, we're always changing. We're always covering different stuff. Comic-cons, football games, outdoor collaborations, battle bots. The list goes on and on. So what, what better way to do a commercial than, than through that unique way? So that, that's what I had my heart set on. So I was like, well, what am I going to do a commercial for? I bet Ethan needs one, so I went. I said, Ethan, I'm going to shoot a commercial at your shop. Okay. I thought it came out great. So once I get the feedback from my uh, instructor, professor, and see what needs to be changed about it, and once it's uh, tweaked a bit more, we'll uh, we'll put that up for you to see. So uh, it shows a lot of the final product, the behind-the-scenes stuff, so you get a, a feel that your product, that your vision is in good hands. So hit up Dynamite Enterprises. Call Ethan, email him, whatever you got to do. DynamiteEnterprises.com. Say, I heard about you on the fan show. He always talks about you. You do great stuff. So first and foremost, headline. Uh, I want to start off on a bit of a somber note so that we can get into the fun stuff. Uh, Paul Allen, the owner of the Seattle Seahawks, passed away due to complications of Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. Uh, That's how nasty it is. I can't even say it right. But Paul Allen, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the world of sports. Um, And a lot of it, for the most part, is playful. And we can get heated up about outcomes of games or things that happened in the game, or a player said this, or a player did that, or a player is dating this person, or a player doesn't care about this, or the coach is doing this, or he's not doing this, you know. And, And we can be armchair quarterbacks, coaches, GMs, and even owners. But at the end of the day, we're all in it for the same reason. We love our team, we love our players, and we are with them through thick and thin, win, lose, or God forbid, draw. And Paul Allen is going to forever be that guy that turned around a franchise and brought Seattle its first Super Bowl title. Because that's what he did. He, he really did. Um, the man knew what the fans wanted. He built the team, you know, he, well, he had help, obviously. You know, Schneider, the, the man's a, a wizard when it comes to, to hidden gems and, and draft picks. But, you know, he brings in Pete Carroll, they draft Russell Wilson, the Legion of Boom is assembled, and, I mean, it's it's off to the races. Two Super Bowl appearances back-to-back. Back. They win the first one, and they lose a heartbreaker to a New England. But uh, this team that him and the powers that be assembled was one of the most feared teams during its, its stretch of time. Nobody wanted to go up to Seattle and play that team because you had like zero chance, if that, of winning, especially in prime time. We're talking Sunday night football, Monday night football. You might as well not even show up. This team was money, and it's the owner's job to make that team money. But he he did as much as an owner could do And the team did the rest. They met him halfway. So uh, Seattle, the Seahawks, the football community, you know, wins and losses, you know, they're great or they suck. But when you lose someone that's just trying to give 
its fans the best quality product out there. You really have to tip your cap to them and applaud them. And the world of football uh, lost a legend in that regard. So rest in peace to Mr. Paul Allen of the Seattle Seahawks. You will be missed. Uh, now on to other things. Uh, I said that Richard Sherman joining the 49ers, I was going to give him five games after which I would let you know my feelings about the Shermanator because I said they could be 5-0 and and he may not be doing a damn thing out on that field to have any kind of impact. And I'll be like, okay, he can stay. They could be 0-5 and, and he could have been on the bench all five games. I'd be like, I hate him. He's brought a curse to this team. <laughs> so... He was hurt and out one game, so I gave him one extra game. So here we are, week six, going into week seven. My thoughts on Richard Sherman are this. Um, God, they had a hell of a game on Monday night. They really did. Oh, that was a heartbreaker. And it was Richard Sherman at the end that there was a sack. It it looked like fourth down, 49ers going to get the ball back, chance to to win this thing. And uh, illegal contact called on who? Richard Sherman. Now, the 49ers are 1-5, and five, and Aaron Rodgers was not throwing his direction. And, they show, and a lot of quarterbacks, uh, every time that he's been in the game, they are not throwing Sherman's direction. So Sherman is doing his job, but by God, it feels like he's a curse on this team, doesn't he? Ugh. So it's tough, because if Jimmy G's in there, is, you know, what, what record are we looking at? If McKinnon was healthy and Jimmy G, what record are we looking at? I mean, there's so many ifs, ands, or buts. So I think I think if there was a healthy Jimmy G and one in five record, I'd be more more furious than I am right now. But then again, you know, Jimmy G gets hurt right out the gate, and so does McKinnon. So is he a curse? Man, I don't know. This is tough because I know that there's so many problems with the 49ers right now. You know, I'm going to give Sherman a pass. (laughs) Pun intended. I'm going to give Sherman a pass because quarterbacks aren't thrown at him. He is doing his job, but the team just has a lot more issues right now and on the defensive side he's very much not part of the problem um he hasn't had any sort of you know notable moments like obj has oh my god can't can't wait for him to not play football anymore but sherman does his job and he keeps his nose clean and i'm gonna give him a pass for right now so uh, as of week six for the Chronicles of Richard on Richard. <laughs> That's what, That might be what I want to call it. Chronicles of Dick on Dick. <laughs> That's bad. Uh, anyway, uh, get your mind out of the gutter, Fan Nation. Uh, I'm going to give him a pass. We'll see. If it gets worse, we might have to reevaluate this. So um, midway through the season, let's give him another three games. See what happens. But for right now, I'm indifferent on him. I really am. Uh, so now coming back to the games themselves 49ers Packers Monday night football what a game and it was save for a few things it was a really great game it it was I can't take anything away from the Packers or the Mason Crosby redemption redemption game or whatever the hell they're they're gonna call it Uh, yay Mason you're back you had one game and yeah we wanted them to release you but we're glad they didn't and I'm like, yeah, I'm so glad he decided to show up against my friggin' team. Because the 49ers, man, two fumbles and and then a late pick by Bethard. So it, let's let's go ahead. The, we have the lead. The 49ers are leading 24-20 going into halftime. Monday Night Football, Aaron Rodgers, Green Bay Packers, Lambeau Field. There's the setting for you. C.J. Bethard. It's not been the best, but he opens the game with a drive for a touchdown, throws an absolute dime to Marquise Goodwin for another touchdown, and he's on fire. He's playing out of his mind the first half. 
And in that first half, that same half, two giveaways, fumbles, special teams, and then uh, the running back. Juice. Juice check. Kyle, juice check. Which, very uncharacteristic. But it's like, my God, they're going to give this game away, and it's not even going to be Beathard's fault this time. The kid did everything he could. Now, he had a late interception. But it didn't, it wasn't like they needed to go and get in field goal range and kick a field goal to tie to possibly send it into overtime. No, Packers drove down. Aaron Rodgers did Aaron Rodgers things and he scores a touchdown. And uh, now the game is tied. This is a chance to win it and not send it into overtime. And Beathard, uh, of all the interceptions that have not been his fault, this one was his fault. And I applaud him for not playing conservatively but at the same time this is a throw that he shouldn't have made just in to be entirely honest at that point in the game it's a throw that you don't make so two giveaways a lead a four point lead at halftime and even with an interception in the wee hours you know what three minutes left we're still tied and then there's an illegal contact call and Mason Crosby goes and decides to make all of his freaking field goals this week. It's like, yeah, I'm happy for him and I'm happy for the Packers fan, but it's like, my God, why couldn't we have the Mason Crosby from last week? That at least would have balanced out the two giveaways and the really unfortunate interception. I mean, Fallujah. That's, that's my thoughts on the matter. So 49ers, uh, heartbreaker, still have the most wins on Monday night. That would have been win number 49, and what a win that would have been. Um, I don't know what that does for the Packers if they lose that game. In fact, we're going to talk divisions here um, probably after Nathan and I talk, just because I know we're getting to that uh, that time of the show. Uh, Derek Anderson, you may remember him from uh, days in Carolina, has been named the starting quarterback for the Buffalo Bills because uh, Josh Allen uh, is hurt for the next couple of weeks and they don't want they don't want none of Nathan Peterman's uh problems out there right now. So Derek Anderson will be the signal caller for the Bills and the Rams and then there were one Rams are the only undefeated team left which spoiler alert means that the Pats took down the previously undefeated Chiefs. Uh this was a great game. I'm not a fan of either team, really. I think the whole Showtime Mahomes things is way overhyped. Um, but there's always got to be that one player each season, right? So the Pats take down the Chiefs, give them their first loss of the season. Doing so, Patriots reclaim their top spot in the AFC East. It only took them six weeks to finally get there, which, <laughs> like, yeah, I get it. Give us a little bit more drama here. Uh, and the Steelers... Over the Bengals, my God, man. The Bengals, they have to win these games. Uh, I I realize that it's a 16-game season, and and every win and loss counts to some degree. But when it's a divisional opponent and you have a history of losing to them, you have a chance to have a three-game lead. I repeat, a three-game lead over the, the ones that have previously been the top dog in that division and and they they piss it all the way at the end, and just good on the Steelers. Uh, I think they win, and just like I said, they live to fight another day with Tomlin and company. But man, the Bengals, you got to win that game. You you have to win games against your division rival. You do, especially the Steelers. Like if you want to be taken serious, you got to win that game. And I remember when the Colts finally beat the Patriots uh, in the Manning Brady. Era. That was the year that the Colts finally went on to and then won their first Super Bowl title under Peyton Manning. So there is something to be said about getting over these these humps. I mean, I don't care how good your record is. There's a team out there that's got your number. you got to get it back. <laughs> like, you just do. So with that Pats win and that Steelers win, despite uh, my 49ers uh, giving me hopes that I could have uh, gone perfect for the first time, in fan versus fan show pick him. I still beat Jordan Andrees, and that felt good. So I'm now, what, two and three? Yeah, I think I'm two and three. 
not bad. I can get to 500 this week if I try. Uh, and to, or, uh, yeah, Devontae Freeman. I almost said Antonio Freeman. Devontae Freeman has been placed on IR for the Falcons, so that's a devastating loss for them. He's going to have groin surgery. Buccaneers fire defensive coordinator Mike Smith. Saw that one coming. Dolphins win an OT over the Bears under quarterback, not Ryan Tannehill. Instead, let the Brocktober celebrations begin. Miami needed that win, especially with the Pats getting that win over the Chiefs. Uh, the Bears, uh, well, they they wanted that win, but the Packers needed that loss. And so did the Vikings in order for the NFC North to be a bit more interesting because uh, for a while there was everybody was playing catch up. Uh, the Cowboys dropped 40 on the Jags, 40 to seven. My God, I, I still think Jason Garrett should be fired though. It, one, one win like that does not make up for like five reckless and conservative, just playing not to, not to lose, but also not to win that Jason Garrett's done as of late. So I say still can him have him win and then still fire him. Be like going out on a high note, Jason, happy trails. And then the Ravens get a franchise-high 11 sacks on the Tennessee Titans as they shut them out. And things in the AFC North have really heated up now. Now, the Browns did not win, and uh, again, it was because I picked them to win for the first time in frickin' ever against the Chargers. I, I've gotten so accustomed to picking the Browns over the Chargers because they were that one win, that one season before they went on the losing streak. I remember that was my... That was my survivor pool last season was when the Browns played the Chargers. I was like, they're going to do it again. They're not going to go 0-16. They freaking go 0-16. Now, of course, they're not going to go 0-16 this year, but it's like, come on, guys. Help me out just a little bit here. Uh, BattleBots gave out its awards as far as uh, voted on by the bot builders and the founders. The Spirit of BattleBots Award went to Monsoon. Very well-deserved. Best Bot Design went to the Boys of Huge. And then the uh, Best Destroyer, I want to say, is what the other one was called, went to uh, Victor Soto and Rotator. And uh, all three of those, I felt, were very deserving awards. So congratulations, guys. That was well done. Monsoon was really a, a great bot, a great team to watch this season. So I couldn't be happier for them. And so with that, then, we're going to break down divisions after uh, Nathan O'Brien and I have a little conversation because it is that time now. And speaking of that time, uh, still plenty of time to place your bets. Uh, we're only midway through the NFL season, but NBA is about to tip off. Hockey has dropped its puck and baseball is wrapping up. So one thing that people ask me a lot for is not only fantasy advice, but also where to take my betting action. And there is no better place than my bookie, M-Y-B-O-O-K-I-E. And I remember who you're betting on is just as important as who you're betting with. And that's why I always tell people that my bookie is the place to go. Uh, endorsed uh, proudly by Kevin Goatee, who's a proud member of uh, Fan Show alumni, been on here a couple of times. I said, hey, here's a promo code for you if you ever use these guys. He's like, I use them all the time. So that's a great endorsement uh, for them. But lay down some cash and win big. You know, it's it's the bottom line is that if you f if you're feeling lucky, I know today was the the mega Powerball. I need to check my ticket, or I think it gets done later on today. But today's the mega Powerball, uh, which you have like a one in three hundred and thirty million chance of winning. Uh, three hundred and thirty million dollars. But hey, you know who's counting? Uh, so if you feel like you want your odds to be just a bit better, then I would recommend a service to you, the listeners, and the good people of Fan Nation. Uh, you're always good to me. I want to be good to you. So go check out my bookie. You win, they pay. They have in-game live betting, the most rewarding player perks in the biz, and your fantasy guys out there, you can bet the over-under, how many fantasy points a player will score each game, all the little details. They're the place to do it. So join now, my bookie. And they will match your initial deposit dollar for dollar up to uh, the first thousand. You use promo code FAN, F A N, football and nonsense, to activate the offer. You visit my bookie online today, enter the promo code when creating your account, and claim the bonus. Again, my bookie. You play, you win, you get paid. And with that, we're going to go ahead and have Nathan O'Brien. 
Lilac and Lake City Comic Con, and a Seahawks fan. Enjoy! All right, ladies and gentlemen, joining me now, returning to the fan show for the first time since this last summer for Lilac City Comic Con, it is the founder, the man, the myth, the legend, and for the first time in Coeur d'Alene for Lake City Comic Con, Nathan O'Brien. How you doing, man? Good. How you doing, Richard? Doing pretty good. Counting down the days, I gotta say, it's a difficult yet exciting time for me. It's a Comic-Con in the fall, so luckily it's on a Saturday and it's a one-day deal, because if it was Sunday, I, I, well, I'm sure you feel the pain, too. You'd be like, what do I do? Do I watch football or do I run my Comic-Con? Well, the question for you is, are the Eagles on the road this week? You're not going to be covering them? Uh, no, actually, so here's the craziest thing about that, is that they have a bye week this week. So Perfect. that it did work out perfectly because I thought about that earlier. I was like, oh, man, the Eagles, that's a Saturday, Comic-Con's a Saturday. And then all of a sudden I look at the schedule and I was like, oh, bye week. Like, that works out. That's fantastic. So, yeah. Nice, nice. But I would have missed I would have missed the Eagles and, and come to the, the Comic-Con just because I know that this is a big deal for you. It's important, uh, which is what we were going to discuss today. Uh, it is the first ever Lake City Comic-Con. Coeur d'Alene, Kootenai County Fairgrounds, but, you know, this is not the first Comic-Con that you founded. In fact, this is sort of an extension of Lilac City Comic-Con, but tell me if you can recall that far back, because you've done the other one for many, many years. <laughs> how, yeah. how does this experience differ as far as, you know, starting a con? Well, this one's really exciting to me because it's kind of a back-to-basics, back-to-our-origins type of show. It's going to be very reminiscent of, you know, the shows that we did um, in the early going uh, when our show used to be called Spokane Comic Con for the first um, six years. And we had them at the community college and they're, you know, a smaller venue, a smaller amount of vendors, and it made it a little bit more intimate. And so um, the idea was that we're going to start this new sister show up over in Coeur d'Alene, give people in Idaho some love. And have something to hold people over um, until, you know, the flagship show, uh, the Lilac City Comic Con in June. Yeah, and I definitely like the idea. I like doing it in Coeur d'Alene. Coeur d'Alene is sort of one of those um, hidden gem cities uh, in a way. I mean, a lot of people know of it. They just don't know, like, where it is. And so it gets a lot of traffic and then a lot of people that when they're there, they don't really know uh, a lot of uh, what to do other than see the lake. So now that that's kind of quieted down, you have this opportunity this weekend to give them something to do in the form of a Comic-Con during a time of year that there's not a lot of, of cons going on. It's summer is sort of the time for cons, and obviously you have your two-day event in Lilac. Um, now, of course, this one being the first one, hopefully uh, the first annual, uh, first of many, but with Lilac being a two-day, what is the advantages and disadvantages of having a, a one-and-done, a one-day con, um, especially being its first time, its first outing? Well, you bring up a good point. I mean, with a, with a one-day show, and that was something we dealt with for years when Lilac used to be a single day, was that it's, it, it could be a one-and-done. I mean, if you're, if you're working, you're, you're preoccupied you know, with, with family, and you can't make it on Saturday – and it's a one day show, then you miss out and you got to wait till next year. And so, you know, obviously, you know, that's a risk that we take with doing a, a single day show. But at the same time, we, we want it to be as affordable as possible, which is an advantage being in, uh, in Idaho, being at the fairgrounds, which is a very um, accommodating um, a venue for us. And they were super excited to, to have us um, approach them and tell them my idea. And they were equally excited because they were trying to come up with new events to draw people to the fairgrounds other than, you know, the, the usual fair and, you know, home and garden show and stuff like that. They wanted to do something that would attract the younger demographic. And so um, they, they have a great facility, um, great staff, and it helps keep our costs down so we can pass those savings on to the vendors, pass them on to um, the attendees. And so it's only five bucks to get in the door. So it's a, it's a win-win in my opinion. Yeah, I know when you and I were talking about it uh, after Lilac City Comic Con, you said that you were really excited for this. Now, obviously, uh, 
two very different settings, two very different venues. Spokane, you've finally gotten into the convention center. Of course, this wasn't the first year, but, you know, it, it was a long road to get there, and that's where uh, an event like this, that's where you want to be, as you told me. Um, but for this, you know, this isn't a Coeur d'Alene convention center. In fact, I'm not even sure if there is one, but you said that this worked out actually really well for you because a lot of the stuff that you have to worry about with a convention center, you don't hear. Is there a place that's, uh, I guess, a dream? destination to have this if it uh, goes off without a hitch or is this kind of how you wish they all could be because of the advantages that you have to doing it at a fairgrounds no, that's 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 fair that's a good point um I, I don't see them as disadvantages i see them as opportunities for us to cultivate the community in quarter lane um to give them something special and give them something unique uh, it doesn't have to be the same level. It doesn't have to be competing with Lilac. Instead, it's something to complement Lilac and something for people to enjoy and look forward to. Whether you go to both shows, whether you're only able to go to one, either way, it's it's an affordable um, and exciting opportunity for, for families of all ages. Now, of course, you have the advantage uh, with this con of it being October, so clearly there's a lot of um, Halloween costumes and spirit Halloween shops out there, and there's sales going on, and people are getting ramped up for their Halloween parties or trick-or-treating, so you, you have a one-day con in October, which is prime for costume and, and cosplaying. Like, What kind of turnout are you expecting for your first ever uh, fan's choice uh, cosplay contest? Oh, we're, we're expecting a, a big participation in that. You know, cosplay is, is huge anywhere in the country, and uh, especially at Lilac um, every year in Spokane. And, and like you said, you know, right around the corner from Halloween. So we're definitely, you know, expecting and encouraging people to dress up. And, uh, you know, we're having the, a brand new type of competition. And part of that was uh, because we don't have a stage in this facility. It's a smaller venue, like I had mentioned. And mm -hmm. so we elected to not um, – erect a stage um, so we could get more um, vendors in the space. But what we did end up coming up with is a, a special photo booth. We've hired a professional photographer that goes to San Diego every year, Comic-Con, and takes photographs of cosplayers down there. So he's quite used to that scene, uh, has a lot of experience. And so with this photo booth, um, on the hour, people come up and take photos, and then we upload them to our Facebook page, and we encourage everyone to vote, fans, themselves, um, and get those get those likes, and then at the end of the show, whoever has the most likes for second and third um, will be crowned the fan's choice for a cosplay uh, contest winner. Now, do you guys have a cutoff time for that? Because I know that the event goes until four, but obviously, if somebody rolls in at like three o'clock, they're not going to have the best chance to get the most votes and likes. As a person That's right. that got it, there at ten. Yes, it, it goes from uh, ten a.m. to two p.m. for to be eligible to enter in the fan's choice. So then they'll have an additional 90 minutes for the people that came in at the very end, additional 90 minutes of voting online. And then by 3.30, we will um, tally the, the vote, so to speak, and then uh, declare the winner at the end of the show at 4 o'clock. Gotcha. Now, the last question that I had for you is, you know, obviously there's several advantages to having something like this in October, as I mentioned, with it being just around the corner from Halloween, a lot of costumes out there, a lot of people already sort of set up for that. And they're like, oh, I'll just throw it on again for a cosplay contest. And, you know, it gives them something to do as the uh, cooler temperatures are, are starting to become a more frequent thing. But, you know, you wanted this to sort of uh, be kind of the in-between, like the reboot, uh, you know, the refresher and until uh, Lilac City Comic Con, which is your baby, a two-day event. And that's June. Um, what was the discussion like as far as why October as opposed to maybe January, like right after the new year, you know, mm -hmm. like in every six months kind of thing? Well, part of it was, yeah, to kind of be somewhere about halfway in between the, the calendar year, but also to consider, you know, weather as a factor as, as well. Oh, you yeah, know, so if we're cool. looking to attract vendors and artists, because we always get a lot that come over from Western Washington, Oregon, and parts of Idaho and Montana. So you figure if they have to go over mountain passes and the and the weather becomes questionable, that can affect their decision with wanting to take a, um, a chance and travel to Idaho. And at the same time, uh, still have it be relatively enjoyable. We figure you know October is you know a time that you know is it's still fall. Yeah, it's getting cooler, but it's not going to knock on wood be miserable. 
weather's looking good so far. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just, you know, so you don't have to worry about, you know, the more extreme conditions of, of the cold. Excellent. Well, I was hoping that this uh, conversation when we had it, because I knew that we were going to have you on to help promote uh, for the last uh, home stretch until the con. But given that it was going to be football season in full swing, I was expecting there to be a little bit more uh, room for trash talk. But I, I really can't say anything myself right now. But uh, <laughs> your, your Seahawks have, have suffered a loss. Owner Paul Allen has passed away. Um, and I was curious as far as do you think that that – really changes anything with the team because there's been a lot of changes in that mm -hmm. area as far as coaching and front office go and then the season they're at 500 right now uh playing catch up with the rams but uh, sometimes this can be an odd motivator you know you're playing for the memory of someone now like do you see it that way or are the problems with the seahawks a bit beyond that no, I think right now, I mean, they, they don't call it a rebuilding year. They're calling it a reloading year, uh, which, which is a, probably a Pete Carroll term. Um, <laughs> but, but, but prior to Paul Allen passing, you know, which was, you know, uh, re really sad to hear, because uh, regardless of whether, you know, you like the Seahawks or not, it's hard to dispute, you know, his ownership and his personality to, you know, to charitable causes. And, oh, yeah. you know, he also owns, owns the Trailblazers and, you know, he's done a lot for, you know, the Northwest in general and obviously co-founding Microsoft. So, I mean, he's done a lot for society in general and just a great uh, human being. Um, but with the Seahawks, you know, I mean, you don't get, you know, victories um, with moral wins. But, you know, they really showed against the Rams a couple weeks ago that they're not going to roll over. And obviously that was the case last year where they were kind of, you know, chugging along and giving people a little bit of hope and then just got steamrolled by the Rams. And so at this time, I think they came out saying, you know, showing that they weren't going to put up with it and at least going to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, even though they just came up short. Um, I think a lot of Seahawks fans had a lot to be proud about. And then going into London, uh, they really um, destroyed the Raiders, which is one of the oldest teams in the league. But, I mean, they, they dominated them. Pete Carroll became the winningest coach in Seahawks franchise history, pass, passing Mike Holmgren which one year earlier than him, yep. which is huge. Uh, so, I mean, I think they have a lot of things positive. The running game started to get going, um, which is which is a great um, plus, and that really opens things up in the play action for Russell Wilson. So I think they have a lot of positive things going on. Does that mean they're going to be a playoff team? I mean, the, the jury's still out. But they also have a lot of home games coming up in the second half of the season after the bye. So it's a, it's a good opportunity. They're sitting in a good position to make a playoff run and maybe even a wild card. So I, I couldn't help but notice the uh, coincidence, uh, wink, wink, and, and it could have been entirely coincidence with how far out things like this are, are planned. But the Seahawks are on a bye week this weekend, the, the weekend of, of Lake City Comic Con. <laughs> uh, so you literally do not have a, a horse in any of the races this weekend. So is it possible that on the fan show I can get Nathan O'Brien, founder of uh, Lake City and Lilac City Comic Con, to say that because they're playing the Rams, who are 6-0, and oh, that he's a fan of the 49ers this Sunday? Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll go as far to say that I was rooting for the 49ers on Monday night against the Packers. <laughs> if there's one team I like or dislike more, it's the Packers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one was a heartbreaker for me. I love how everybody's just like, way to go, Mason Crosby. You redeemed yourself. Yeah, it sucks for my team that had to be the one that he decided to actually make field goals against because we all yeah. know that that was the, the difference maker there. So, um, but Would you rather have them lose to a field goal or lose to a Rodgers Hail Mary? Uh, I, I, I feel like it's almost better to lose to something like that because he's known for it, and it's like mm -hmm. it's it, – even watching it, it, he's done it, what, like four or five times now? And yet it's oh, yeah. still one of those just ah moments where your jaw drops when you're when it happens, where you're like, there, there's no way he can do it again, and then he does it again. I, I Yeah, I would rather lose on a, a Aaron Rodgers Hail Mary than a Mason Crosby field goal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the one part, too, that must have hurt as well was the, the penalty on fourth down that would have got the Packers off the field uh, caused by our boy Richard Sherman. Yeah, and you know, I, I said that I was going to give it five games to, to form my opinion, and, and they're, they're at one and five now, six weeks in, and, and I got to tell you, I'm, I'm so indifferent about him because quarterbacks aren't throwing at him, so he's clearly doing his job, but my God, when there's a play like that, there's all these conspiracy theorists out there like, ah, oh, Sherman's still playing for the Seahawks because he's sabotaging <laughs> the 49ers, and it's it just, oh, it really bugs me, but there's that. There's I'll, the, I'll take that. 
There's the late uh, <laughs> Bethard interception when all they had to do was get in field goal range. But, you know, that that worried me too. Mason Crosby having such a, a terrible game and then coming in and having a great game and our kicker not having any issues, it would have been just I, I wouldn't put it past a scenario like that for Robbie Gould to go out there and miss what could have been a game-winning field goal. You know, it, it right, just it, right. it makes perfect sense. But uh, – <laughs> Well, uh, he is the founder of Lilac City Comic Con and now coming to a lake city near you. It is Lake City Comic Con in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. It is this Saturday, one and done one day only. So get there 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and there will be a uh, cosplay fans choice first ever contest. Uh, very affordable to get in, but uh, Nathan, fantastic job with everything. I think even... Uh, Regardless of how this goes this weekend, that it's uh, you know very positive from you that you even uh, attempted to do uh, another one. But I think with how well you've done with the original, this one should be no different. Well, thank you very much, and we're looking forward to having you as well. Yeah, I look forward to being there. I'm not sure how I'm going to dress up if I will, but uh, obviously there's plenty of superheroes that wear suits. So we'll see if my uh, if uh, the guys at Indies can do a, a Tony Stark for me, and, and maybe we'll, there you go. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that. But I will see you Saturday. Enjoy your your bye week and your week of nothing but focusing on uh, all things Comic Con. But you enjoy uh, the rest of your week. I'll see you Saturday. All right, go Hawks. <laughs> go Hawks. Yeah, of course he did. <laughs> Thanks, bud. <laughs> Bye. All right, big thank you to Nathan O'Brien of Lilac City and Lake City Comic Con. Always a pleasure to have uh, someone, you know, multiversed such as him. He's, uh, he's a big comic book nerd, obviously runs his own freaking Comic Con, but also a football fan at heart, even if it's for the wrong team. You know, I, I don't uh, judge or discriminate too severely for that. So as promised with the last couple of minutes here on this Wednesday edition of the Fan Show, we were going to take a look at the teams where they are now in the standings given that we are going into the midway point and who I believe really needs a win this weekend. Now there's several teams on a bye week, so there are certain teams that really can't do anything about their own fate except for sit back and watch. And if you're one of those few teams that you're hoping for another team to lose, I have no sympathy for you. So the standings as of right now through week six, so going into week seven, um, which is uh, the the midway point of the season, that's uh, roughly about where we're at, um, I guess week eight technically is the is the midway point, but um, you, you get the you get the idea. I think that this, I really think week six, week seven are wins that are more critical for teams than wins in weeks uh, eight or nine or even ten, really. And and here's why. So uh, on the AFC side, okay, the North Bengals lead at four and two. In the South, Titans lead at three and three. In the East, no surprise, Patriots four and two. In the West, the Chiefs at five and one. Then you know, let's go ahead and toggle back. Then so that's the AFC side. Division leaders once again: Bengals, Titans, Pats, and Chiefs. So this weekend, several teams on a bye, but we do have some key matchups here. Now the Titans. They take on the Chargers, and the Chargers are also 4-2. and two. So wouldn't you know it, they're a game behind the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, it's kind of a, a mess in the South, really. Uh, Jaguars 3-3. Three and three. Texans 3-3. Three and three. Colts might as well not even bother. I think they're 1-5 and five as well. So it's a three-team race. In the South, clearly a division that I do not believe a wild card team will emerge from. So the Titans, they really need this win, but I'm going to say that the Chargers need the win more because there's not a three way tie in the West right now. The Chiefs have a one game lead, and although the next teams in the division, in regards to uh, who's next up for <laughs> the. For the West, it's not very close. I mean, Denver is 2-4, and four, so they're two games behind the second-place Chargers, three games behind 
the first place Chiefs. And then, of course, Raiders. Do we even want to go there? They're on a bye week. Thank God they can't lose. They're 1-5. and five. So uh, the Chargers need this win more. And simply because the Raiders don't play, but guess what? The Chiefs and the Broncos do. Now, the Broncos will play the Cardinals. Broncos 2 and 4, Cardinals 1 and 5. Broncos, they, it's a road game, but my God, they need to win it uh, if they're going to have any hope of getting to the postseason. So, right now, for the AFC West. It is the Chargers that need to win the most in order to... They've got a winning record. Very surprising, I think. And they could keep it within a game. They could tie it if the Chiefs were to take an L. Who are the Chiefs playing this weekend? Where is the... There's always one freaking team that I can never see. They're playing the Bengals. My, oh, my. Now, the Bengals, they're in the lead. And let me just tell you that the Steelers are technically a game behind at 3-2-1. and one. That's why they're a game behind. That tie is going to suck for a while. Why? Because if they had won or lost, let's say that they beat Cleveland. They don't have a tie. They would be 4-2 and two and actually be the division leader in the North. There would be no tie. There wouldn't even be a game back. They would be tied and with the tiebreaker going into their bye week. That's sunshine and rainbows right there. But instead, they are 3-2-1. and one. That tie is haunting. And so the Bengals, they will take on the Chiefs. The Chargers need the Bengals to win. The Bengals need the Bengals to win. The Chiefs, they can lose and still be first place in their division. I don't see really anyone other than the Chargers giving the Chiefs more than they can handle as far as you know, trying to take the throne that is the AFC West. So Bengals need a win. Chargers need a win. And the Steelers are going to want the Bengals to lose, obviously. And the Chiefs are going to want to win so that they keep that nice one-game gap on the Chargers and the rest very much firmly in the dust. Now, as far as the East, we've got the, uh, the Dolphins. They are playing who the dolphins dolphins are playing the lions a very winnable game now they're four and two so they are tied with new england but they did lose to new england so new england has the tie breaker new england they play as well and they play the bears who are three and two i'm gonna say the bears need this win more than the patriots do even if the dolphins were to win i think that that's nothing that bill belichick and the patriots can't overcome but given the fact that the the packers won and the vikings won and both have a tie between each other packers are on a bye week so they can't do anything but if the bears want to keep that division lead that very unlikely divisional lead they need to win against the patriots it is at home but uh, that is a tall order. I, if, if there is a team with the right defense that can do it, I believe it is the Bears. I don't know what happened against the Dolphins and Brock Osweiler, but uh, that defense has been nasty. And so I think the Bears, the Bears need that win to keep it, to keep that uh, one-game lead on the, uh, the pack and company, which looks like we also have the Vikings – and they are playing. Where are the Vikings at? Where are the freaking Vikings? Why can I never? F- oh, Vikings are playing the Jets. Jets are three and three. If the Jets want to be in the conversation at all, they need to win this game. Vikings need to win it too because the Packers can't win or lose. The Bears have a likelihood of losing playing a team like the Pats. Let's just be honest. So if they were to win, they would take possession of first place in the NFC North. But we're talking about the AFC right now. The Jets need to win this weekend. The Browns need to win this weekend. And the Browns play the Buccaneers, who I don't think I don't think will win. I, I would confidently pick the Browns in that scenario, even it being a road game. So the Bengals, the Browns, hell, even the Ravens, the whole AFC North that's playing, because the Steelers are on a bye, needs to win. 
<laughs> they they all need to win because the AFC is a tough nut to crack when it comes to wild card contention. Dolphins need to win, and I believe they will get one against the Lions. And then we also have uh, Colts one and five, Bills two and four. Texans and Jaguars play each other. Either one of those teams needs this win. So unless they tie, um, one of them is going to inch closer to the Titans, who play the Chargers. Chargers need that win. Titans need that win. So I'm going to say the AFC side of things, there's more wins needed right now than there are teams that can can take a loss. Now on the NFC side, as we mentioned, the North is uh, being held by the Bears. The South, the 4-1 and one Saints. The East, the three and two Redskins, and the West, the six and O oh, Rams. Now the Seahawks are three and three. Arizona one and five. San Francisco one and five. So really, there's not a team that needs a win more than Seattle. And uh, Seattle, they actually play who this weekend? Seattle Seahawks. They play. They are on a bye week at 3-3, three and three, so there's nothing that they can do about their own destiny except for hope that the 49ers somehow beat the Rams this week, and they would love that. The Redskins play the Cowboys 3-2 and two against 3-3 three and three is what the Cowboys are. Cowboys probably need to win this, but uh, the Redskins being at home, they're going to want to keep that lead that they have over the Cowboys right now. So uh, Redskins win, that's good. Cowboys win, that makes things a bit more interesting and a hell of a lot more complicated. Uh, The Giants, I don't think they're anything to worry about right now. As long as they have Odell Beckham on that team, I'm going to say it, I think Odell Beckham is a a team cancer, I really do. Uh, They are 1-5 playing the Falcons 2-4. Falcons, my God, they need a win. Saints are two games ahead, but it's there's very much opportunity there because the Bucks aren't going to do anything. And the Panthers, well, the Panthers are three and two. So yeah, they're only one game behind the saints, but they've been probably the most inconsistent team in football. They play the three and three Eagles, your reigning super bowl champions who would very much like to get a win in order to be in the conversation as far as the NFC East goes. So Eagles and Panthers, both teams needing a win. Uh, Cowboys and Redskins, both teams needing a win. But there are far less teams on the NFC side of things that need a win right now than there are on the AFC side because the AFC side is just a mess. Wild card teams, I'll go ahead and tell you right now. I, I think obviously the Chargers are in a good position to be a wild card team and the Dolphins. So Chargers, Dolphins as of right now. And then whoever ends up winning the AFC South on the NFC side, though, I'm going to say uh, probably, as crazy it might sound, the Packers. And then probably someone out of the South or the East. I don't know. I don't think the East is really going to produce a, a second playoff team. That team is going to be whoever doesn't, <laughs> whoever loses the least amount will uh, <laughs> be the winner of the NFC East. So. Yeah, I'm going to say probably the Panthers as of right now. We'll see, though. Panthers, like I said, most inconsistent team in the NFL right now. So AFC side needs a win collectively. Uh, There's a lot of teams that are scratching, clawing, fighting every square inch that they can to set themselves up for what is a crucial week in the league because the Seahawks don't play, the Steelers don't play, and the Packers do not play. Uh, However, the Seahawks' next game is against Detroit. That could be very interesting. Steelers' next is against Cleveland. God, I hope we don't have another tie. And the Packers' next game is against L.A. So week seven is going to say a whole hell of a lot about what we may see come December, January. So uh, that is going to do it for this Wednesday edition of the Fan Show. Don't forget to stop by Indy's Barber if you're in the Spokane or Pacific Northwest area. Get a hot, get a quality haircut and a hot towel shave. Tell them I heard about you on the Fan Show, and they'll give you 15% off. So until next time, ladies and gentlemen, best of luck to you and yours. Go Niners, and remember, of course, it's all fun and games until you butt fumble. Good night, folks. Do you remember the time that Mark Sanchez ran into his blue player's butt? That was funny sports.
Thank you for having me on the show, man. I love the fan show.